It's my great pleasure to introduce one of our outstanding alumni, Don Shaughnessy. Don received a bachelor's in chemistry here at Berkeley in 1993, and after graduating, she remained at Berkeley to pursue a PhD with a focus on nuclear chemistry, uh, which of course is a field that was practically invented here in our college. She joined the research group of Professor Darlene Hoffman and received her PhD in 2000. After finishing graduate school, Don began a postdoctoral appointment at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory before accepting a position at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the Stockpile Radiochemistry Group. Don has been a staff scientist at Lawrence Livermore for 16 years, where she presently is the group leader of experimental nuclear and radiochemistry and principal investigator of the Heavy Elements Group. She's been involved in the recent discovery of several super heavy elements, outdating that table right over there, including atomic numbers 114 to 118 and the naming of 116 as Livermorium, which is very cool. In 2010, she was awarded the DOE Office of Science Outstanding Mentor Award and the Gordon Battelle Prize for Scientific Discovery for the discovery of element 117. In 2012, she was inducted into the Alameda County Women's Hall of Fame for Scientific Discovery. And in 2016, she was named number nine of the 100 most creative people in business by Fast Company. Dawn's Chemex talk today is titled, Looking Past the Periodic Table, The Discovery and Chemistry of the Super Heavy Elements. Dawn. Thank you very much for having me back. I have to date myself and say, I think the last time I was in this room, it was still called PSL. Does anyone remember PSL? Thank you. I don't feel so bad now. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm here today to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, the periodic table. And this is how it looks today uh, with its completed seventh row, the transactinides, all the way up to element 118. This is uh, how it looks with all of its names now having been approved by IUPAC. And uh, we know from sitting here that the periodic table is a big part of not only your chemical education, but a big part of your life. I mean, it's part of everything. We saw the iPhone earlier. If it wasn't for rare earth elements, there'd be no iPhone, right? So uh, it, it really permeates every aspect of our life. But of course, it didn't always look this way. And 2019 is actually a very special year because the UN has declared it the International Year of the Periodic Table because we are celebrating 150 years since the birth of what we would consider the modern day periodic table as created by Dmitry Mendeleev. Now, before this, there were different versions of the periodic table at that time with the known elements that were all a little bit different. But this was really the first one where the elements had been placed according to their mass. But it was observed that chemical properties were repeating at regular intervals. And because of that, they were able to figure out that there were missing elements at that time, things that should be known but had not yet been discovered. Probably the most uh, clear evidence of this is where the rare earths would be. They're completely missing from this chart because it wasn't until the early 1900s when the rare earths were all separated from one another. Now, the natural elements end with uranium, which is element 92. And after that, there was a push to try to get to new elements, which would all be, at that point, man-made synthetic elements. And it started really right here at Berkeley across the way uh, and with Professor Seaborg and his group. But once the actinides then were discovered, what would then drive to do the next set of elements, the transactinides? Is it just to keep saying we got elements on the table and, and the fame and glory of it all? Trust me, there's not much fame and glory in it all. Uh, but actually, it's more than that. It really has to do with the structure of the nucleus. So let me take you into the nucleus uh, for a short time. We know with electrons, of course, that they like to fill their electronic orbitals. And when we have closed electronic shells, we see enhanced stability, the most extreme example being the noble gases being primarily inert. But the same is true in the nucleus. And the, the protons and neutrons also like to fill energy levels within the nucleus. And each energy shell can accommodate a certain number of particles. And when you fill one of these shells, you also see an enhanced stability of the nucleus. And in this case, what that means is you might see a lot of different isotopes for a given element. For instance, lead, which has a closed proton shell at 82. There's a lot of different isotopes of lead. 
Or if you're into radioactive species, into the actinides and beyond, you'll see enhanced stability against radioactive decay and longer half-lives. And so we know what the last magic proton numbers are. We call them magic for whatever reason. Uh, here shown is nickel, tin, and lead. And then the question, and this was Glenn Seaborg's chart from the late 60s, the question was, what comes next? There has to be another closed proton shell. You can calculate what it would be, and most of the calculations center around element 114, with 184 neutrons being the closed neutron shell. So the question was, could we get there? Did we have the technology and the wherewithal to get to that next so-called doubly magic element, 114? and validate our essential knowledge of the nucleus and how these energy levels should be. And so this was really what drove Seaborg and his group beyond the actinides to start venturing into the transactinide elements. So how does one do that? It's relatively simple in concept, difficult in execution, like most things. At its most basic level, we just add protons. So I have an example up here of an element 116 Livermorium reaction. So if we can take something like calcium with its 20 protons and a nucleus of curium, which has 96 protons, and we can completely fuse them together into some com what we call compound nucleus, for that moment, there's 116 protons present, which means we have an atom of Livermorium as long as we can detect it and validate its presence for even a short time. Well, that's a little bit tricky because, as you know, protons being positively charged, they don't like to fuse together, and there's a huge Coulomb repulsion between trying to get these two things to fuse. So that's where the particle accelerator comes in, invented by Ernest Lawrence and namesake of the Lawrence Berkeley Lab up the hill and the Lawrence Livermore Lab a little bit east of here, where it's probably about 99 degrees right now. Um, but how does a cyclotron work? So this is a very uh, rough sketch, just to give you an idea. That's a picture of the U400 cyclotron, which sits at the flare-off lab of nuclear reactions in Dubna, Russia, which is where our team collaborates and does our experiments for heavy element discovery. But they all basically work the same. There's two large magnets up here in the shape of the letter D. And if you put your ion source, in this case calcium, in the middle and we apply an alternating voltage across those magnets, we'll start to accelerate the ions into a circular orbit. And as we keep alternating voltage, we'll keep accelerating them faster and faster in a larger and larger path until eventually they're going to get somewhere close to the speed of light, like a tenth of the speed of light or so. And then we can extract this beam of calcium. And at this point, they're highly energetic. And we actually have a chance to overcome the Coulomb barrier between the calcium and, in this example, a curium. And maybe they'll fuse together. But to be honest, that happens very infrequently. In fact, the probability is extremely low, and most of the time there's no reaction at all. Sometimes there's a grazing reaction where you may just transfer some particles or you may fall apart right away. So most of the particles coming out of the, the cyclotron reaction are not what we're looking for. So we have to separate them out from the background. Now in the early days, uh, I should say the, the lighter transactinides, like 104 and 105, they used chemistry for this because they made enough and they were long enough lived that they could separate an atom of rutherfordium or dubnium away from all that interfering background. But now with the length of these experiments, and these go on for several months usually, uh, actually, the tour de force was the discovery of nihonium-113, which was a year for two atoms. That's, that's high patience right there. Um, so what we use now are mass separators, and I have a cartoon of one right here. Basically, it's just a series of magnets where we can tune that magnetic field to be sensitive to the mass to charge ratio of the heavy element we're looking for, in this case, our livermorium atom, and it can pass through the separator. Whereas anything where the mass to charge is not tuned to that, things like beam particles or unreacted particles, they are steered away so we can reduce our background looking for these literally single events. And if we can make one, let's say we can get our projectile, our calcium and our curium to fuse into this compound nucleus, then we have to detect it. And if we can get it to fly through the separator, it will implant itself in a detector that looks a lot like this. These are a series of silicon semiconductor strips. And they're sensitive in energy and position along the strip. 
And these things are all radioactive, so they undergo a series of decays, as I've shown here. In this region, they primarily undergo alpha decay. What that means is they spit out a helium nucleus. And when that helium nucleus comes out, this detector can record its energy and time. And because we see a series of decays, we can then go back through the data and look for this decay chain and correlate everything back to our original parent. Now, the amount of data that's accumulated, you can imagine, in 3 to 12 months is enormous. So we're very lucky at Livermore that we have some of the world's fastest computers that we can use to sort through this. But again, overall, you're going to see possibly zero a lot of the time to maybe three atoms per 10 to the 18 calcium that you start with. So these are very difficult experiments. But they've been done, and this is uh, the, the chart, and I hate putting up tables like this, but I just wanted to kind of go over what we have in terms of names, where they were discovered. And here I put the longest isotope that's known currently for each one. And so the question you may have at this point is, well, so what? Did you get to the magic island or not? You have 114. What's the answer? And the answer is sort of, and here's why. It's not just the 114 protons. We still need that 184 neutron shell. And the way we do these experiments with these type of reactions, we're still, unfortunately, way too neutron deficient. So we're nowhere near that closed neutron shell. So we're not going to get to that, that doubly magic nucleus. But what we are seeing is the effects of a closed proton shell. Because when they calculate these things, it's not just that center point, that center isotope. There's a region of isotopes that feel that they're getting close to that closed shell. And you do see an enhanced lifetime. So if I go through this a little bit, you see we start with things that are minutes to this one dubnium that's a day. And then we go down into the tens of seconds tens of seconds, and then we get to fluorovium-114 at two seconds. Right now is the longest lived guy. And then it falls apart. We're now sub-second all the way to sub-millisecond when we get to Oganesson-118. So what happened? Well, this is likely the cutoff between the closed shell at 114. And just like in the electrons, when you fill the noble gas and now you add one S electron back into the system, you have a very different reactivity. So it is here, where we have something that lives for two seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot. But now look, we've completely fallen off the cliff, and we're orders of magnitude less stable. So we are indeed seeing the effect of something in this region. We just can't push out a neutron number. Can we get there? Well, we're developing things called radioactive ion beams. There's a facility called FRIB that's getting built at Michigan State. There we can get a little bit more neutron rich, uh, but we'll just have to see if we can ever get to that next, that next uh, neutron shell. Very quickly, I want to point out, when they first did these theories of 114, and you read some of the really old papers, there were some that thought the half-life of this was so long that they actually did searches in nature for it because they thought it could live years. So we know now that's not quite the case. But let me come back to chemistry and the fact that the periodic table is the roadmap to chemistry. Now, we put elements in as they're discovered by number, frankly, because it's convenient. We know as we discover each one and we link it genetically through its decay chain back to other known elements, that we have a certain proton number, and we put them in the chart, and all is good. But we know from Mendeleev and beyond that that's not quite right. We can only put them in the chart if their chemistry lines up. We know if we go down any given group in the periodic table, I should see a consistent trend in chemical behavior. But when we get down to the transactinides here in the seventh row, again, things get a little complicated. And that's because of relativistic effects. So what I'm referring to there is the fact that we have very massively positively charged nuclei. I mean, we have over 100 protons in these systems. And they're so massive that they're actually accelerating the inner orbital electrons to near relativistic speeds. And if you think of E equals mc squared, you can imagine already that we're now affecting the actual mass of the electron. And that's affecting the bonding and the chemistry. And we do see this, actually, in the lighter transactinides, particularly in rutherfordium and dubnium here. 
If you perform a chemistry, say some kind of extraction down these groups, you see a pretty regular extraction pattern, and you think that these should just fall in line under hafnium and tantalum. But what we see instead is an inversion, where when we get to that last row, we're not seeing something that looks like hafnium and tantalum. The chemistry jumps back up and becomes more like its much lighter neighbors up here, zirconium and niobium. And that is due to relativistic effects. But now that I've sold you on it, the, the irony here is that when we get to seaborgium up to hosium, the chemistry here is actually pretty regular. It does follow its group trends, just as you'd sort of imagine. In fact, when the paper came out on seaborgium, I think the name of the paper was something like pretty ordinary seaborgium, psi, nothing interesting. But when we get past here, the chemistry gets very difficult, because remember those half-lives I showed you? We're talking seconds if we're lucky. So doing chemistry on something that lasts a second, while not impossible, is quite difficult. But the holy grail right now for chemistry in this area is fluorovium again, because of this closed shell and the interaction between the nucleus and the electrons. The chemical theorists, a lot of them are predicting that fluorovium will actually behave like Radon, not lead. They don't think it will be metallic like lead at all. Now, based on the way the periodic table is constructed, if that's true, is this correct? Does this really belong under here? So in Germany right now at the GSI lab, they have been working very hard on doing chemistry of fluorovium in the gas phase, because that's a little bit faster. And the experiments have been a little inconclusive but what they're pointing to, if it all holds up, is that indeed fluorovium behaves like radon, not lead. So what does that mean for our periodic table? Well, before you go out and start futzing with it again, there still has to be a lot of work done on that because it's, again, very hard to do these experiments. We've been working at Livermore to try to do aqueous chemistry on 114. I'm not sure if we'll ever get it in my time there uh, just because of the challenges. We make one atom at a time and we have to transport it, get it into chemistry, and do something on that atom that we can pinpoint that it has some chemical behavior. So we're looking at macrocyclic ligands, uh, specific sizes that are sensitive to what we hope would be a fluorovium that we could pull out of solution very quickly. But if we can do that, that might help shed some light as well on the fluorovium chemistry. Uh, or these gas phase experiments as they continue may firm up and we may indeed see a fluorovium that really should be under radon. So real quick, what I want to leave you with is how far can the periodic table go? So I was just at the American Chemical Society meeting where Professor Pico, who's been doing these kind of calculations for quite a long time, showed this monster up to 172. And now we introduce the 5G electron in the superactinide series, as Glenn Seaborg called it. But he was the first to admit that as a theorist, it was very easy for him to do the calculation and put this up. But the reality is we're never going to see this just because of how difficult it is to do these experiments. The production rates I showed you are extremely small, and the half-lives at 118 are sub-millisecond. So how do we get there? There's been searches for 119 and 120, and I can tell you at various labs, and so far there's been exactly zero observed. And that's because the production rates are just too low. Plus then there's the physics of actually doing this experiment. You have to transport something and detect it. So we have really fast electronics nowadays, but there's fast and then there's really fast. And so right now, our Russian colleagues are building a brand new cyclotron to try to get more intense beams. Uh, they're also looking at different beams rather than using calcium. Can we use something else? And I think in my lifetime, maybe, maybe, we'll see a 119 or a 120, but I'm guessing that's gonna probably be close to it. So there may be other elements in theory but physically, we probably won't see them. So my last slide, I just wanted to put up sort of an acknowledgement to show you how large the teams are that do these experiments. This was the Tennessee Element 117 group, everybody from around the world that participated. And when I put this slide up, I noticed right off the bat how many of us in the colors, I apologize if you're colorblind, how everyone in color either did a postdoc or was a graduate student here at Berkeley in the nuclear chemistry program when it was here. And that's quite a few. And it really makes me very proud that the house that Seaborg built 
discovering elements, we have been able to continue to this day. So with that, I just want to thank you again for your time today. Thank you.